Hi, my name is Nicole and welcome to my channel. In today's video, I thought I would talk about my story and how I went from being a bit of a shopaholic, living at my parents' house that was very unkempt, very cluttered and almost like a level one hoarder's mentality to being an extreme minimalist that lives in a one bedroom flat with my toddler. And there are many, many highs but there are also many lows, including the final part of the end, which I'm very excited to share about because it has decluttered a lot from my calendar. So let's get started. Right away, all the way back in about 2010 or 2009, I found out about Scandinavian style bedrooms because one of the <laughs> so cringe, popular girls on Facebook at the time uploaded a bedroom selfie. And in the background of that selfie, there was a white bed, a white wall, white furniture, and maybe some other typical Scandi style, sort of bedroom style furniture. And I think their mum was a designer. And I was also very envious at the time of this girl because she was very, very pretty. I envied her popularity and I envied her looks. And now I was envying her bedroom. When I looked around at my mum's rented house and particularly my bedroom it was very different i do have a couple of pictures that i've shared already in the community tab but i can also insert some pictures here of what my bedroom looked like at the time i really wanted a beach themed wall it never happened thankfully and on this wall was posters the entire wall was filled with magazine cutouts and at the time I had an eating disorder so most of those cutouts were like inspo, there was that and then I had lots of stickers, random stickers on the door and in this picture you'll be able to see lots of dressing gowns and lots of body care products and makeup and I, I don't even know, I can't remember and lots of mismatched furniture and at the time my sister lived in the bedroom that was upstairs and that bedroom was about 20 foot by maybe 12 feet and it had a its own bathroom and I remember looking at that bedroom and just being like wow it's so big it's so spacious because she didn't have a lot of furniture although it was mismatched there wasn't a lot of it my sister cannot tidy up her room and I was like, maybe it's a storage problem. Maybe it's a, the room's too big problem. Maybe it's my mum buying problem. I don't know. But I remember this square bedroom that I had and it was much smaller. And it had a bed, a desk, a bedside table, a chest of drawers and a wardrobe, which was standard at the time. It was standard to have all those things and also to have all those things within those pieces of the furniture was standard. It's kind of how I lived. I just remember my room at that time being very cluttered, very disorganized, very messy. I could never keep it clean. And my house growing up was not the best, like tidiest house, even though we had like a, a cleaner, despite her own buying habits was always telling me to tidy my room. And obviously I couldn't because I could barely keep it together because there was just so much stuff in such a tiny space my mum, bless her. A year later, we moved from that place to a different place. And the option for those rooms were to have a single room, which is basically the size of a king size bed with a wardrobe that was built in. To be in this square big room with a double wardrobe. I, of course, thought that I needed to have the bigger room because I have a lot of stuff. So I took that room and I remember there was a double bed, a desk, a bedside table, the double built-in wardrobes, shelving and mirrors and just so much stuff. At this point, I had a friend move in who was pregnant and we slept in the double bed together and obviously all her stuff came with it. And it was just a very cramped time, to be honest. That room was very different. I didn't want to paint the walls like a sea theme. I just wanted to leave it white. And at that time I really wanted a white furniture, so I had white furniture. So I had the style of minimalism, I just didn't have the lifestyle yet, which was going to come a lot later. At this point from 2009-2010 up to 2015, 
all I cared about was the minimalist style. I didn't care about it as a lifestyle and I certainly didn't know anything to do with it that I do today. So fast forward to 2015, I discovered that at 19 I was pregnant with my first child. The relationship, if you could call it that, I'm not going to go to details, it's very, very, very complex, very complicated. Would never ever want to do it again. Fell pregnant uh, at 19. I just got fired from my first job. I just left college and I was living at home with my parents and it was just a very turbulent, chaotic, crazy time. At that time, I was also going through an eating disorder. Definitely, as I found out later, undiagnosed OCD. This is where the story gets a little bit sad, a little bit triggering, a little bit upsetting and just really unpleasant. So be warned because this next part is not very nice and it's not something that I'm totally ready to talk about. Although I've spoken about it publicly because I used to do public speaking, that's a different story in itself. Not that you could tell because I'm very, very awkward on camera, but it's different when you're not on camera doing public speaking. So yeah, anyway, around this time, I got given a fuck ton. <laughs> it's the only way I can say it. A fuck ton of stuff. I was living in the bigger room of the house at the time. It had a single wardrobe, but it was longer in length, but shorter width and the room was blue and grey. I had a single bed, a bedside table, a chest of drawers, the single wardrobe and then nine underbed boxes and a cot that wasn't in use yet, full to the brim of stuff. There was stuff for myself of course and there was stuff for my little baby boy that was still in my belly and duplicates of almost every single type of baby equipment thing that you could possibly imagine in this room because I was living with my parents at the time and my mum is very good at sourcing free stuff but she does not know when to stop. I got given loads of free things from like zero months all the way up to two years old and I was given, like I said, duplicates of everything except for the cot. When the cot came, it was the wrong colour and I was very upset about that because it didn't fit in with my minimalist aesthetic and I was really just not happy with that. There are pictures and I was just miserable. I was so, so, so miserable. I was desperate to at the time, I thought I was better off in a mental hospital with my child, which kind of is bonkers to think because of where we are now with my other child. I fill the void with thinking that if I looked really presentable all the time, then everything will be absolutely fine. And this was really sad because in the UK, when you're on benefits, because I was at the time, you get given £500 to spend on your child and really desperate to not feel the shit that I was feeling. It's the only way I can describe it. And so with that 500 pound, I spent the last 50 quid of it on a pair of thigh high boots because at the time I was going to a teenage parenting baby group and I thought that to fit in with the other girls and to be liked and accepted and to somehow it transparent or transport me into being a good mum. And it's a really sad, desperate, lonely memory that I have and will keep forever. In fact, I was so desperate to buy stuff that I thought would fill this void that I had, that I spent the last of my month's money, so that like after this I had no money, on those shoes because they weren't cheap, they were very expensive for me at the time, because I knew that my parents were gonna cover the cost of nappies and wipes and milk. That uh, memory is horrible. I hate that I felt that way and that I felt so desperate and lonely and anxious and horrible about myself 
and how that transferred into my really negative parenting experience and how my oldest son at the time could have been or was impacted by that. Some people say that he's not impacted by that because obviously the time has been so long. I still think that he might be because I don't know, but I, I still worry that it, it impacts him. <laughs> it's not an easy story to tell. And I think this is why you'll be so surprised to hear this from me now, considering the way that I am living my life now. In terms of possessions, but just generally. Anyway, at the same time, I was never going out. So I have my baby and I remember looking at him and something about it was just really sad and dark and depressing. And I just, I don't know how to describe this feeling right now, um, but I just didn't have a connection, I think, with him at, at the time. And that obviously, carried on because at the time, even in 2015, I was being told, you're gonna love your baby, you're like, you're gonna love him, everyone loves him, They're all, you're just gonna fall in love. And I don't think that happened straight away. At the time, I reverted back into an eating disorder. So I had that going on as well. And then things were just really going really, really bad. I had a dissociative episode and I ran downstairs to try and take my life. My oldest child wasn't safe. And that forever will haunt me. I'll always feel regret over that and disappointment in myself. Just adding to the message of how much I was really struggling at the time. It then transpired that I was gonna to go to a foster placement. And in this foster placement, I don't know if it was the greatest setup. I was her first parent and child foster placement and I think I was too vulnerable for them to deal with. So I don't think it worked out well. I have a different memory of what happened compared to the foster parent. I think or believe that I was trying to do everything and they were pushing to do it. They wanted to do everything and was pushing me out they have the opposite of you of that. I don't know which one's right because I honestly can't remember because I've blocked most of it out. With that move, I had to have two cars pick me up with all our stuff to take me to her house. And five weeks later, unfortunately, my OCD showed up big time. It was undiagnosed, people didn't know what was going on. And I was freaking out. I was freaking out. I thought I was going to hurt my child. I left my firstborn at home with the foster placement and I went shopping. Which, like, when I got home, I was told to pack my stuff and leave. What I should have been doing in those hours, because I knew it was happening, because I heard about it, I should have been staying at home, cuddling my baby, crying my eyes out and just begging the placement and the social to change their mind. Didn't do that. Nope, I went shopping. This is why I don't like shopping. Yeah, I went shopping and I am forgetting a lot of details uh, because it's suddenly coming to me. But also throughout this whole period, I was on my phone constantly. I never ever came off my phone, I think, unless I had to do something because I was asked to do it for my child. I remember one specific time, he was asleep in the basinette, I was on the sofa, he started crying, waking up crying, and I didn't do anything because I waited for my parents to come in and fix it. Ugh. I, ugh. Ugh. I do not like myself when I think back to that period of time. I do not like it. It's relevant though, because it is part of my minimalist journey, so, it's important that I include it in. I just don't know if the amount of detail I'm giving is a lot. <laughs> but maybe it helps someone, I don't know. We were separated, so I went to a temporary foster placement and then I went to someone else's house that my mum was friends with and then I went back home. When I got home, I decided that the environment was not one that I wanted to be in anymore. This is where the decluttering began because it started out with that 
Then there was the cluttering naturally of giving all the baby stuff to the placement so that they could keep my baby and I and his stuff at their house and I took all my stuff back. I was very preoccupied with the room that I was in at the foster placement. I, I thought it had to be a certain way. And again, I should not have been worried about that. I should have been focusing on my baby. But as we know, you know, shopping and decor stuff is what I was doing to fill the void. So it continued. I got home and I just realized that, you know, at the end of the day, I've just lost custody of my child and all this stuff that I've been worrying about over the last few weeks, months, really, when it comes down to it, like, it's just bullshit. Like, none of it matters. He was what mattered and I failed at looking after him. I failed at looking after myself. And as a result, I've put this very small, fragile, vulnerable child in harm's way. I wasn't addressing the important stuff, I was addressing the easy stuff. So I don't exactly remember the process. I know that I had a lot of court paperwork, so I didn't really touch that yet. And at the time I was focusing on all the stuff that I left at my parents' house originally. I tried to get rid of that as much as I could because I had a parent that was a bit like, don't get rid of stuff, even if it's broken, even if it's mouldy, don't get rid of it. So that was a bit hard. And then I... I don't know, I got rid of clothes, I got rid of decor that I had at the time, I got rid of DVDs and CDs I had, I got rid of books. I was very meticulous about what I kept because at the time I wanted to give out an image even then to, I guess, social services that I was a capable parent. So I would make sure I displayed all these books that I'd read but didn't actually apply. And I would like display these certificates that I got for parenting that I wouldn't actually apply. I just tried to paint this picture that I was actually a lot better than I was. So yeah, I changed my room so that it looked like I was amazing when I wasn't. And yeah, just continued to get rid of stuff. And then I can't remember how it happened. I was ready to leave my parents' home because it was getting really, really toxic and verbally very aggressive, understandably so, because I was not in a good place and they were not, still are not in a good place. I was going to try and find somewhere to live. And so to do that, I wanted to be able to leave and get up and go very quickly. I downsized even more to the point where I hid uh, cooking stuff underneath my bed. Because originally that was the plan, that I was just gonna find a place and go and not tell anyone. Got really poorly. It was coming up to the end of the court case and I was not improving. I wasn't addressing my eating disorder. I got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and I wasn't, I mean, I was in therapy, but I wasn't applying the techniques at that point to real life. I just wasn't ready to address my shit, even though I said I was, I wasn't actually. Court was coming up and instead of turning up at court, I decided to take my first overdose which landed me in the hospital which then landed me in voluntary inpatient and so I had to take all my stuff there as well so I spent four months in an inpatient facility and at that time unfortunately in some ways I got a lot sicker I had learned bulimic behaviours I made a friend with someone who I was doing that with the hospital knew about it. Um, I don't know if it's poor care or if it's just the way things work, um, but they weren't addressing it. They weren't separating us or anything, so it just got worse. I was mucking around on this ward. I was in some bonkers states mentally. I, I had an episode where I couldn't stop talking and it was just pure nonsense and I was just like verbal diarrhea, literally, just over and over and over again. There was another time where I was sky high and I was jumping off sofas and just bonkers. I took some meds that were of a high dose and I, I don't have any memory of that whatsoever. I was dissociating and thinking and feeling that I was 
this disgusting, disturbing, horrible creature. I was sleeping on the floor, which is interesting. I think was also me engaging in some BPD behaviours because another girl was doing it. So I was like copying and trying to make myself as bad as I could possibly get in a way. And I thought if I slept on the floor, my sleep would get really bad. I was just, I was like, am I trying to be these different people? Oh, I don't know. It's like um, identity crisis. I was having an identity crisis, trying to play the sick girl as much as like, I like, like, it was weird. It was weird. I somehow applied to college and I got in. Because I was going to college, I left the hospital and I went into a B&B. I had to go from the hospital to the B&B in a taxi and then from the council office to the B&B. To do that, I had two suitcases and half an hour of walking to do. It was really interesting. But hold on, reverting back because this is really confusing. In the hospital, I did a lot of decluttering. <laughs> At the time, my brain was warped and so decluttering was a form of trying to kill myself, I guess. Weird. It was very, very helpful because I managed to go from 2,000 pieces of paperwork down to like zero. And I used Evernote to do that, which is freaking amazing. Oh, I love that app. I went to a B&B and the door didn't lock properly. I had a sink, I had a radiator and I had a bed and lots of furniture that I didn't need. And I decluttered even more because then I could hand wash all of my clothes and I did that every day for five weeks. At this point I was walking to college every day for half an hour each way, no an hour each way, in heels. What the hell? <laughs> How did I do that? I have no idea. I made some friends at college which was really nice but this was when I decided to go like really extreme and be a minimalist, like not just in the physical sense, but start looking at the other things as well because I addressed the papers and then I started addressing the digital clutter in my life. At this point, I still was on every social media platform that I could be on. I was still heavily relying on my social media and being on the screen 12, 10 hours a day. But I was also really into my studies and I'm really proud of myself because I went from like no GCSEs to five GCSEs and it was amazing. And I'm so grateful for that point in my life. Uh, five weeks after moving into the b, &B I got a place in a supported living and I was really, really lucky. I got a mahoosive room with the windows that were mahoosive. It was an old Victorian um, building converted into supported living and I moved in there with just three suitcases, a folding table, a folding chair and some paperwork. The move itself was like 10 minutes, 15, 20 minute walk each way and I did it in about three, no, two, I, I walked twice back there, yeah. and. When I was there, there was a bed already supplied, a bedside table, a chest of drawers, a fridge freezer, a sink, my own sink, which was exciting, uh, a shower, and a massive closet. And I loved it. I loved being in that massive room because of the light. I had my own shower, which was amazing because I had five weeks without it. It was a really weird layout. There was a wardrobe, then the sink, then the shower and then my bed and then the bay window and then the fridge and later I had microwave table and chairs and a sofa and it was it was amazing I loved it the, the room was amazing really bad carpet but just an amazing room and I lived there for three years and during that time I kind of increased a little bit of what I had um, I went through a zero waste phase as well during that time and at that point, I was still relying on social media to have some kind of identity. So I somehow fell into the cleaning realm of Instagram and I bought 200-ish cleaning products. Bearing in mind, 
what I just said about what was in the room. They were all pink. For some reason they had to be pink. And I took lots of Instagram pictures and edits and uploaded it. It was a very short-lived thing, so I don't know why I went so overboard. During that time though, I was obsessed with collecting everything and lots of different scents, lots of different smells, lots of different labels and brands and aesthetics. It just bonkers, really awkward phase in my life. It's really hard to remember it all, you know, like the details. I feel like I should stop and save the whole experience of living in this place as a separate video. This is where I really started to transform and where this amazing news is going to come in. Um, maybe I'm going to leave it here. There's so much to say. There is so much involved within my minimalism lifestyle that I don't know how I can fit it into one recently decently sized video. So much is entwined with my minimalism, like my mental health and my minimalism are like so closely connected in so many different ways. And I just, <laughs> I don't know how to, how to capture it all into a way that's gonna make sense for people. I don't wanna just skip over some really important, awkward details. Um, because the sad moments matter as much as the good moments and I don't want anyone to think that my minimalism journey has been really smooth and easy and simple because it wasn't, it, it started with a bit of envy, it exploded because of a really sad desperate moment in my life and it's become something that's really incredible out of this world, amazing, fantastic part of my daily life that I just didn't think it would ever be. And I don't know where to start this story, except for the envy part. And I don't know where it ends because it's never gonna end. It's gonna be like this for the rest of my life. And it's only gonna get better because I'm getting better. Um, I guess I will end here for this part. Please join me. Um, next time for part two this is like I said where it's gonna start getting really happy and amazing and positive the next part's not gonna be so triggering I think <laughs> it's gonna be a bit sad um a bit embarrassing maybe but definitely not sad and there's no overdoses in the next part so that's exciting <laughs> um yeah um I see you next time bye